Welcome to today's Sunset Safari. My name is Brentley Smith. I have Vim on camera. We have uh, Jamie and uh, Dangerous Dave out on the other vehicle, and Louise and Geraldine in final control. So we're just coming to have a quick look where we left Tingana, sleeping on the Sunrise Safari. Apparently he did get up and move, but I'm hoping he didn't move too far. So we're gonna do a quick circle of this area, and you'll see now. I'll show you exactly where he was sleeping. He got himself a very good spot, so I'm quite surprised he moved as it got hot. And we are experiencing some gloriously warm last days of summer, so to speak. Uh, th today is 32 degrees Celsius and 92 Fahrenheit. So he got himself right underneath that fallen down tree there. And he is definitely not there right now. So we're going to go have a look around. And he was lying in that little thicket there. There's a little cave under there. It was quite nice and cool. So I wonder what prompted him to move when it was hot. Could it be he's still on the chase of interlopers in his territory? Now, believe it or not, in between Juma and Torchwood, which is where we are now, right on the eastern edge, there were three different male leopards seen. So there was old Spooky, or Phantom, as we've been nicknaming him. He was also known as Gajima. Uh, there was Tingana. And then quite far to the east, I'm sure a lot of people will be very happy to hear this, but there was a good old Mr. Q, the quarantine male leopard. For a lot of our new viewers, you won't know Mr. Q, but uh, when I started, he was Karula's, one of Karula's last successful litter. And he was a fantastic male leopard we used to see a lot of. And as he's got older, he's had to move out of his natal territory. So he's down to the south east of us. Now, there's not a track we see every day. Nothing there, Vim. Which is not a leopard track. Um, but it is definitely worth having a look at. Um, which one are we on here? The oh, the door. Sorry about that. How's this one for you, Vim? Can you get this one? So if we have a look carefully here, and if I put my left hand down next to it, there's a slight resemblance. Much longer back pad, though, but you can see the thumb there. Now, or there, sorry. It is a baboon track. So it looks like a single baboon has wandered down the road here. I know, more than one. There have been a couple of baboons. And VM and I actually had a brief glimpse of them not so long ago, but unfortunately weren't able to get them on camera. But maybe today will be the day when we find a big chap of a baboon. Me being me, I managed to create a tangle in about three seconds. But here we go, and done. Ooh, the baboons crossed off there. And one second, just on the radio. Afternoon, Orbs. Uh, no updates yet. Jamie checking last position of Karula, and I'm following up on Tingana. He apparently moved southwest from where we left him this morning. Okay, so we just check uh, the person is, uh, sorry, just to Copy, thanks, Orbs. So let's send you across to Jamie so she can bid you yeah. a good evening and see what she's up to. Good afternoon and welcome to the Sunset Safari. I've just returned to the site of where Karula had her kill yesterday afternoon. And one can certainly smell the scent of decay starting to set in on this hot afternoon, but no sign of Karula. And it doesn't look like she has eaten any more of that carcass. It's hanging slightly lower than it was. It probably just slipped down a little bit but there's no sign of her returning back to feed on the rest of this kill. That's very interesting. I had thought that perhaps she would. 
She might also have just decided to abandon it. You might have managed to catch something, as we've spoken about many times before. Leopards are incredible opportunists. Uh, if any opportunity presents itself to go hunting, maybe while she was returning back from feeding her cubs, and if a Steenbrook or a Dacre made itself um, too obvious or available to her, she might actually have eaten there and then continued back towards her cubs. Now, this morning I was talking a little bit about looking for her tracks and whether or not we could judge where she, if she'd moved her den back across our southern boundary. It appears, however, that she did cross Gowry Main. Brent found her tracks after I'd checked there, so she was obviously wandering through at some point early this morning. And she has gone back south to Little Gowry, so that's, I think, where she's hiding her cubs out for now. Give me a puff back track. I think I'm going to leave the drainage line, carry on looking, see if maybe she's in the process of making her way back, see what else we can find along the way, and then we will return back here when it starts to get dark. She might decide to come and back, come back and have a quick snack. I got totally distracted and I didn't properly introduce myself. Sorry, Dave. <laughs> My name is Jamie. I have Dave on camera with me this morning, oh, this afternoon. And Dave and myself have now done this U-turn how many times, Dave? Three times? Yeah. But we're going to do it once again, the Austin sti Powers style 20 point turn to get back out of the drainage line. Unless, of course, you would all like to do a Milwati drainage line riverbed cruise in reverse, and do it backwards. Could be entertaining. Less so for my neck, but we could do it. <laughs> Wouldn't be the first time I've done a Milwati cruise backwards. The nice thing, of course, about these short wheelbase Land Rovers is that we do have the turning space to be able to do this might have to endure some spiking from a spike thorn along the way. Here we go. We're almost there. Here we go. Oh, I'm very glad I'm not in a very long safari vehicle. That we've only got Dave on the back and not other people. There we go. Sorted and turned around. Still haven't managed to get stuck there yet. Now that I've said that, I feel slightly concerned I might have jinxed it. Now, yesterday afternoon, Jandre and myself had a wonderful time just sitting in the drainage line with Karula, watching her sleep just off to the side and listening to all of the bird life that frequents drainage lines areas such as this. It's basically riverine vegetation. As we drive through, we spoke a lot about favorite trees a couple of drives ago, and there really are some incredibly spectacular examples. This is truly one of the most beautiful spots on Juma. Look at this enormous jackalberry tree. most extraordinary tree and you have to wonder at exactly how old this tree is and what is witnessed in its life. Hello little one. I hope you're not still looking for your baby. I doubt it. I think she's just moving through the area because that's what Nyala like to do. This is the perfect habitat for them. She disappears off into the vegetation. We're going, co going to continue out of the Mulwati. Let's find out what Brent has to tell us. So, good news. No tracks of Tingana coming out of this block. Bad news. It's a big block. So, I'm quite sure he maybe just moved a little bit to sleep somewhere else. Maybe that spot became a bit too hot. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to the last position we saw him and then I'm going to take a little stroll and hopefully I'll be able to find him on foot and then we can get the vehicle in there afterwards. And if my luck holds, the last time I tracked him on foot I managed to catch a glimpse of him catching an impala. 
Okay. <laughs> Let's see what happens this time. So there is a squirrel alarm calling, but a bird of prey flew over. Well, hello to Sarah, one of our lovely regular viewers who's 18 and in Ohio. And Sarah would like to know, have I heard anything about one of my favorite leopards, Kunyuma, recently? Sarah, I have not, unfortunately. I'm not sure if he's been seen for a while. I, last I heard, he was heading more south. Do you spot the leopard? Oh, you must have driven past him just now. VM has spotted the leopard. We nearly drove over his tail. Hello, Mr. Tinganana. So he's moved maybe 50 meters. Well, he's denied me my walk, but isn't this wonderful? He's right next to us. Hello, big boy. Busy day chasing all these naughty males coming into your territory. <laughs> oh, back to snooze, which I think he's going to be doing for quite a while today. Not well spotted Vim. There you go, he is sleeping. Um, we are very close to him, he's lying right next to the road, but as you can see, he's popped his head down and gone back to snooze. But I am probably going to have to move uh, to give other vehicles a chance to get in here as well. Hey. Now, he is quite hungry, so it's definitely going to be worth playing the patience game and staying with him uh, while he's there on Juma today. We are hoping he will hunt later. He did look very hungry when I saw him walking this morning. You can see that sort of hollow pit in his stomach. Yes. Poor boy. You guys, it's going to be on the Game Drive channel for a second. Our stations have located Tingana on Central Road, very close to the junction with Drakensberg, uh, lying up next to the road. One station here, space for two. Our leopard streak continues. I think it has been since Thursday last week that we have had leopards every day. Uh, seven days so far, tomorrow will be eight. Now, it is a big challenge, but our record was 29 days on the trot with cats. So this is a good streak. We haven't had an eight-day streak for a while. Well, not eight, seven so far. We'd have to find leopard tomorrow to make it eight. Or lion. It is incredible how beautiful those patterns on a, on a leopard are. And each leopard has its own individual set of rosettes and spots. So even though from a distance they do look very cleanly, and on closer inspection as we're doing now, you'll notice quite a lot of ticks on him. And some in his ears there, and in between his in between his ears as well, there's a big gray one. And you can see how those biting flies have, there we go, there's one landing right now. Oh, and he's got stable flies. 
and have done quite a bit of damage to the outside of his ears. Katrina on Twitter says, a round of applause for VM. Good spotting. I concur, Katrina. Well done, VM. VM's being shy and modest now. great that we're so close to him and we can have a look at a bit more closely at his fur and, and the ticks and things and Walt our buck would like to know is a leopard's fur soft or coarse well a bit of both the, the top part is quite coarse but that white underbelly is very soft and fluffy but not something you really want to play with lots of nasties that live on leopard fur and uh, lots of little parasites that can easily jump ship from leopard to human. Now, uh, when you do d deal with captures and stuff with big cats, uh, you always wear gloves and uh, have a course of deworming medicine close by. <laughs> Whereas what happens with gloves is they always get broken or ripped, so you often end up working without gloves. And so always good after you've done a bit of big cat game capture and to have a good deworming session. Make sure you haven't picked up any extra friends from the, the big cats. So leopards, like lions, do sleep for quite a lot of the day, not quite as much as a lion, but a male leopard can comfortably sleep for 18 hours a day, and especially when it's warm like this. He's probably not going to move too much. So we've been chatting about these irritating stable flies that keep biting not only the leopards, but the cameraman and me. And uh, Bob is wondering, with the cold weather coming, are we likely to get any respite? And we will get a little bit of a respite, and there won't be as many flies as in the winter months. But uh, I think not quite there yet. You hear a white-browed scrub robin calling in the background. Beautiful call. Oh, tired kitty. So Don is referring to yeah. his whiskers, saying, yeah, I noticed that he had both black and white whiskers. Is, is this normal uh, in most cats? And with leopards, I have, seen, I have seen some that have had no black whiskers at all, uh, but most of them will, do, will have both. And sometimes some of them have Stripey whiskers. I noticed that on Tundi, she had one or two stripey whiskers that were both black and white. But 
but most of them will have predominantly white with a few black. Where's that bird that's just discovered the leopard? Can hear that alarm call. What are you doing here, cat? Can you see it, Joe? Sounds like a little prinia or cysticula. Just waiting to try it. See if it pops out into the open. It might come out into the open to harass the leopard. Ah, and it decided discretion is the better part of valor and moving away. I don't think he's going to be doing too much moving, but we're going to just move into a different position uh, for now. So let's go see what Jamie's up to. Unlike Tingana, Dave and myself are doing a lot of moving, searching for different animals to show you. I'm actually heading across to the southern boundary to see if I can't work out exactly where it is Karula crossed in the hope that I can return later this evening and follow that, the route that I think that she would take back towards the carcass. Interestingly enough, I know that Brent was talking about the baboon tracks on Cheetah Cutline, and I've just a whole lot more. So they obviously moved through this area at some point in the middle of the day. They're on top of my vehicle tracks from this morning. And it's such an interesting thing because we hardly ever see baboons out here. And I'm aware that previous drives or in previous years, they used to see baboons on a very regular basis. They even had a name for the troop of baboons known as the Gowrie Gang. But I still haven't managed, that's one animal I still haven't managed to get on our live safaris that I would have thought, you know, if you'd asked me before I started working here, I would have thought that there'd be lots of. It seems as though the drought has played a big role in their movements and a lot of them moving towards the, the larger river systems and the constantly flowing river systems further to the south of us. Richards shares my enthusiasm for the prospect of a baboon sighting. Uh, there, that's exactly where the tracks have crossed out. I agree, James. I think it would be awesome to get them on a live drive. I'll show you where I mean exactly. Oh, no, sorry, my mistake. That's a hyena crossing. That's not Karula. That is definitely not Karula. I'll show you how easy it is to make that mistake, though, when you look quickly. Can you get that track there, Dave? A paw print next to that ant mound. There we, there we go. Um, <laughs> come out a little bit. Let me see if I can, if I can figure this out. Yes, it's just a little bit to the right there. So where those big buffalo tracks go through, and the track is just behind it. Come down a little bit, a little bit more. Where is this thing now? I'm very confused. Ah, oh, there it is. <laughs> there we go. That is the paw print that we're looking at, the hyena track. And if we move, follow back a little bit sort of to the right, we should be able to see more of them clearly. Here we go. Now, this is a, a really nice idea that was suggested by one of our viewers that was to screenshot and start a list of tracks, almost like our bird list. And I thought that was a really brilliant suggestion. And we can actually do two here. And I'll jump out and I'll point them out to you. And Dave will just let me know if Tingan is up and if Brent, anything is happening with Brent, so never fear there. But if we just have a look, and I'll try and get my shadow out of the way. This is a hyena track going in that direction, so you can screenshot it, and maybe with something for scale, 
would be a good idea as well. Perhaps my hand for scale would also just help. Just out of sight, Jane. Is it just out of sight? No, if we reposition the vehicle just Okay. Out of sight. Um, can you get the tortoise tracks as possibly from here? Or is that also a little bit too close? Uh, it's just, again, out of sight. Okay. <laughs> I've just put the vehicle a little bit too close to the tracks. So we'll shift ever so slightly. That doesn't help Dave at all if he can't see over the side of the vehicle. Let me see if I can't shift a little bit. The biggest problem is this quite large tree that's off to the left of us. How are we doing there? Cool, perfect. Thank you. Here we go. So there's a tortoise track for you. Let's start with that one. And you can screenshot that. I'll hop out again, if I can get out. And I can just show you something about the direction that this track is going in. So if I shift my shadow out of the way, have a look at where the dirt is flicked in that direction. So it's, as it's walked, its toes have dragged a little bit and it's flicked the dirt away from the track. So this tortoise is going that way across the road. And the hyena track, I actually think I'm going to find a nice, a really nice clear example of a hyena track. I know where there are a few, and I think it might be slightly better for your tracking scrapbooks. I think that's maybe a good name for them. Rather than a track list, tracking scrapbook or tracking notes. It's up to you what you decide to call it. I think a tracking list is a bit, it's too like our bird list. We need a really good name. Tracking tips. You can add screenshots of the different animals and start your own list of the different tracks. And the question this morning actually came through was a request for things like waterbuck and impala tracks, tracks that we don't always necessarily stop for. So I think that's something that we're going to be doing more of in future, depending on how action-packed the drives are. If we have moments, we'll stop and we'll do a track or two a day. Or a drive, per drive. We have a viewer, Terry, in Oklahoma. Now, Terry's been watching the drives for a few weeks, but this is the first time Terry's actually sent through a question to the best of our knowledge or that we've seen. A first time interactor, as it were. Terry's curious as to whether or not, on the subject of our baboon tracks, whether or not we ever see monkeys on our live drives. And yes, absolutely we do. And I'll keep a lookout for some. I know where some of the different groups of monkeys live. So we'll keep an eye out for them. See if we can't get them on camera for you, Terry. We've had some amazing sightings of monkeys. I had a little one playing around with an older sibling or an older cousin. We've had babies falling asleep on their mothers, shouting from the trees. In fact, yesterday we had the monkeys on camera because they led us, essentially led us to Karula's kill. They were alarm calling in the top of a tree, barking down towards her, letting, her, letting everything know in the area that a leopard was trying to hunt. I'm sure that Karula wasn't feeling terribly impressed with that whole deal. We were talking about it afterwards and Brent and myself even came to the conclusion that perhaps she, when they started alarm calling, she'd actually made that in Yala kill. And the monkeys were alarm calling in response to that. And she'd maybe just made it on the opposite, on the sort of the top of the drainage line and then later dragged the kill down into the middle of the drainage line. So yes, in answer to your question, we definitely do see monkeys. We also see their much smaller nocturnal cousins, the bush babies. Now those are a little bit harder to keep on camera due to, first of all, the fact that we only ever see them at night, or generally only ever see them at night. The very rare, very rare sighting that we might see them during the day. But they're tiny, tiny little lesser Galago, lesser bush baby. 
Just want to check this last set of tracks. These are leopard tracks crossing in. They're not very clear, but they're going straight towards this pan. And I'm just gonna take us through there. They have been driven over, but at least they are crossing back onto our property. And who knows, Karula might even now, even in the heat of the day, be moving back towards that kill. Let's go and investigate. See if she's not resting in the shade somewhere here. Those tracks have been driven over, so they're not fresh, 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 but that is a main road, so there's lots of traffic up and down. And that could be a little bit fresher than they look. And especially with vehicles moving up and down, that often creates dust and wind as they move through, and that also ages a track far faster than it would age normally on a road like the one we are on at the moment. plenty of water around so her movements won't be dictated by the presence of water or the ability to go and have a drink. Now we're checking all of the patches of shade to see if she's not somewhere in the vicinity. What can we have here? Having an afternoon cool off. There are so many buffalo bulls around at the moment. It's weird because about 10 days ago, we went through a buffalo drought almost. We hardly ever saw them. And now all of a sudden, all of the males are back on Juma once again, occupying these pans or little miniature ponds. Pan is the name for a smallish, a smallish pan, a smallish pond. He looks particularly contented. Look how wide this individual's horns are. As he sits ruminating on both grass and life. He's got very, very wide set horns. It's amazing. I never would have thought about it before I started working here and before I spent so much time looking at the details of the individual animals but I never realized how totally distinct each individual buffalo bull is from another. I never would have thought about it, but they either have different growth patterns of their horns or more scarring. There's one that's got half a horn missing on the right-hand side of his head. There's one that's blind in one eye that we saw this morning. There's also one with the most remarkably straight boss. It looks like he's got some kind of hairstyle going on. It's very easily recognizable. I never would have thought about that before I started these live drives. Before that, a buffalo was just a buffalo. I want to just go back and double check these tracks and look very carefully to see exactly where she's gone and exactly how fresh they, these tracks are. While I do that, let's find out what's happening with Tingana. Oh dear. It seems as though Brent doesn't have any signal just right now. Not sure exactly what happened there, but Rusty doesn't have any picture. So we'll continue on our search for this leopard together. And who knows, we might get lucky again. She might be right next to the road. Keep your eyes peeled. This is not a particularly large block. In other words, there's not much sort of bush felt between the road that we saw the tracks on and the road that I'm on now. We should be able to see where she comes out. Lots 
lots and lots and lots of hyena tracks. These are tracks in the road coming this way. So she's walking along here. She's walking back towards Treehouse Dam. And it might be my imagination, but I don't think it is. Oh, she's walking up and down. She's pacing. Let's just try and work out which direction she's going or which tracks are fresher. Isn't that interesting how she's walked such a similar route backwards and forwards? Okay, she's gone off the road. Oh no, she hasn't. There's some there her tracks are. Just bear with me one second. I want to work out if her tracks... No, her tracks going this way are far fresher than the tracks coming this way. This is a tricky one. Just give me one second. I need to get out of the vehicle. I need to see which track falls on top of the other because that will tell us which direction to search for her in. She's come, her, track, her tracks are going this way and that way. Come on, Karula, I need you to step exactly in the right spot. Okay. Her tracks going that way are definitely fresher. Oh, I hope she's at the dam. I hope she's somewhere close by here. Perfect. She's walked exactly the same line that she chose to walk from that kill back towards her den site and then from her den site back in the same direction. And that's just taught us, that little moment has taught us so much about the way that she's moving. Now I'm gonna concentrate really hard on just following exactly where those, these tracks lead to while I do that. Brent has signal again, so let's jump on the back of his vehicle. Sorry, guys, we're not sure what happened there. We had a little gremlin explosion. But look at him. He hasn't moved at all yet. Uh, he's just rolled from side to side. You can actually see how he's flattened the, the vegetation just to the left there. But the flies irritate him occasionally, and then he rolls around. But as I was saying, if we look towards his back, you see just in front of his back leg, you can see it's quite concave there. And that's what leads me to believe he's quite hungry. So it's definitely worth sitting out the quiet times with him because he is probably going to try a hunt this evening. And he's probably been preoccupied chasing all these interloping males around. So, and his last kill that we know of, He caught on oh, a few days, I think, Saturday. He's probably eaten something small in between. But I wouldn't want to be anywhere else but sitting here with one of Africa's most elusive and a beautiful big cat. And I know Tingana has fast become a favorite of many of our viewers. As we've seen quite a lot of him um, in the movement of leopard territories over the last six, seven months, with Mvula being ousted and has been actually lost almost 95% of his territory to Tingana and to another male leopard in the north. Well, we've just been chatting about leopard territories and movements and M. Kiss, a brand new viewer. Welcome, M. Kiss. 
is asking, do these leopards ever meet? Or do they stick solely to their own territories? Well, they do meet. Um, and if it's two males, uh, the dominant male will definitely try attack and chase the subordinate male. And I think that's what happened this morning. I think this guy chased off that male leopard we've been seeing over the last few days, the unrelaxed male from the north. And uh, he has definitely set himself and established himself as the dominant leopard on Juma for the moment, but that's the thing, they constantly change. And they also do come into contact with the females. And when they come into contact with the females, uh, if the female's got a kill, quite often they will steal it. Quite often they'll just sort of pass each other, ignore each other. But it is a very interesting dynamic. And of course, the time they actually spend lots of time together is when they're mating. Now, speaking of a female leopard that this guy has mated with, let's go to Jamie. Guys, this is awesome. I felt like those tracks were so fresh. She was in the road and she's hunting something. Look at that stalk. She's definitely interested in something around Treehouse Dam. I can't reposition at the moment. I'm just going to let her get further ahead of me. She's at, oh, she's gone down into, no, she's still walking. I wonder what she's seen. Ah, oh, there's nothing more satisfying than tracking and finding a leopard. Okay. And she is, is she crouching or is she just lying down? She's far enough away from us that we can reposition slightly. I just said to Dave, these tracks are so fresh that I feel like she's around the next corner. And she was. Okay, I think that she is just lying down now. I think that she's just taking a break in the shade. Her body posture's changed completely. She's just lying down. Okay. Oh, that is an awesome feeling. Two different leopards on our drive again. Don't quite have Brent's record, but we're not doing too badly. Hello, girl. I cannot wait for when she decides to bring her cubs out into the open. I'm so excited for her. And she's looking so incredibly well. Okay, we've got a duck under this bush, just to avoid going too much into her personal space. You okay there, Dave? Hold on. All right, we're going to carry on forward and then I'm going to show you why I've stopped. We just have to get out of this bush. Just let's stop here for one moment. There's some impala on the other side here. They've moved into a perfect position for her. They have no idea that she's here. They've stopped to feed. She's stopped to rest. She's very full-bellied. And a large catch like a male impala is hard work for a female of Karula's size. I don't think she's going to do it, but you just never know. I spoke this afternoon about how opportunistic leopards are. 
Everything in her body language says she's just lying down in the shade. And that she's decided not to go for it. But if they wander closer, she might just be persuaded to change her mind. Now, an adult male impala, for a leopard like Tingana, or of Tingana's size, is not a stress. It's still a difficult catch, but it's something that they would attempt. In general, female leopards tend to target much smaller prey, and particularly with Karula. Apart from that adult female impala kill that she made a little while, quite a few months ago, when the impala ewes were still pregnant, I haven't seen her target adult male impala. This is so awesome. Now I did briefly, you, you might have realized when I got out to check those tracks, you might have seen me stop and look up and check. Oops, she's gonna walk right past us. Yep. She's decided that the Impala are not worth the risk of the injury. She's got fresh, fresh suckle marks on her belly. We will have a chance to get a view of them. I'm just letting her move away from us for now. She's thirsty. It's time for a drink. Oh, it's so lovely to see that. These fresh little ring marks around her nipples from where the cubs have been feeding. Sorry, I got completely distracted from the point I was going to make. Let's not get stuck here. Hmm, she might find herself with some stiff competition at the dam. No, she's walking right past it. Find the log. There's a lot of buffalo bulls here. Not really worth the effort to go and see if she can have a drink here. Not when there's so much other water around. Now this could actually get very tricky. She's going to go into the drainage line that runs to the east of Treehouse Dam. And she could well lose us there. So I'm gonna get onto the dam wall itself. Here we go. Stop here. Oh, the lap wings are so cross. They're gonna, I think they're going to dive bomb her. <laughs> that tail picked up in irritation. They thought about dive bombing her. If it had been crowned lapwings, they probably would have. Look at that delicate leopard walk with the tail up in the air. At the station at Treehouse Dam. Negative, um, come join me. I've just got Karula on the dam wall now. Let's get a bit closer to her. Cat, you are absolutely right. We have been so spoiled with leopard sightings recently. I'm not gonna be complaining though, and I'm sure you're not either. Karula, are you gonna? No, she's gonna walk on the road. Yes, that's perfect. I was so worried she was gonna go down into this drainage line system. Mm. 
this stunning afternoon light. Now, as I was tracking her, you'll notice, you might have noticed me look up very suddenly. And that was because I suddenly realized just how fresh those tracks really were when I was off the vehicle. Now, that is not because I'm worried about Karula as a threat to me on foot, but more to do with the fact that I did not want to scare her away. And Errol was wondering, are leopards on foot more of a danger than, for example, lions? Are they unpredictable and dangerous? Or is there a safe distance you can be from a leopard on foot? It very, it very much depends on the individual leopard, Errol. For a safe distance, Karula is an absolute star on foot. She's perfectly comfortable with the presence of people. And we're going to just loop around this corner and catch up with her on the other side. She's giving me the space to just get ahead of her. Oh. Yeah, that's fine. So, Errol, I've, we've had sightings of Karula 20 meters away on foot. Yeah, we found ourselves with a bit of a stump there. Hopefully we can squeeze past. Just keep an eye out for her for me, Dave. Clever girl. Okay, well, I try and figure out exactly where this mystery, mysterious cat has vanished to. Let's go back to Brent and his leopard. Isn't this incredible? Double cat bill this evening on Wild Earth's Safari Live. And you've just come to us as Mr. Tingana. Looks like he might be in the mood for a bit of movement as well. Started grooming. Maybe not quite ready for a move just yet. Oh, he's going to carry on grooming. We might get some nice big yawns. There we go. He's found a flea or a tick that he's trying to get off. He is a beautiful leopard. Nice big boy. I reckon probably around 80, maybe just over 80 kilograms. What do you think, Bill? Mm. Maybe, maybe 85, so a very big leopard. Uh, it's very uncommon to get a leopard 90 kilograms and higher. And he's definitely bigger than Mr. Mvula, who is the last dominant male leopard here. Now, but one must remember, with a lot of animals, size isn't everything when it comes to dominance. Uh, often you'll find, sometimes, especially with lion coalitions, the most aggressive is dominant, not the biggest. But if you're the biggest and the most aggressive, then you're winning in the wildlife. Maybe we should try move around to the other side of him. Voilà. 
Valeria, I have to agree with you 100%. She says we've been incredibly lucky um, with all the leopard sightings we've been having. And I must definitely agree with you. I won't say it's all luck, though, Valeria. There has been some good hard work and some wonderful tracks to follow. And that is the lovely thing. When the leopards are here, there's always a good chance we're going to find them. We just have to keep very still when we're this close, but there we go. Nice view of his face. West of Jordan or so. It looks like he is getting ready to move. Yeah, look at that wonderful big dewlap on him. There we go. Oh, perfect timing. Or is he, I think he's just got uncomfortable in that spot. So you quite often find that with leopards and lions, they keep moving from where they've been sleeping just because uh, the ground gets hot. Oh, look at that light on his face. Mr. I know it's still hot, but would you kindly oblige us and go hunting? I've got a slightly stronger suspicion he's going to kindly oblige us and lie down flat. I might get a nice yawn here. Where's my camera? I'm going to get ready. I think he might yawn. So remember to share your screenshots of these beautiful leopard we're seeing. And you can pop it on Twitter with the hashtags Fire Live or pop it on the Safari Live Facebook page or any of the other <laughs> Safari Live groups. And there's lots out there. Look at that. Back to sleep. I did think it was a bit early for him to get moving, but you never know. Animal behavior is a, is a fascinating thing. It's constantly changing. As Vim pans down the body, you have a very nice, clear view of his paw. Do you have it, Vim? Do I need to roll forward slightly? No, there it is. Look at that. We followed those footprints a few times. James on YouTube says Cheetah used to be his favorite big cat, but now seeing so much of Mr. Tingana, uh, he thinks he might be leaning more towards leopards. As we're just going to move around because otherwise, and um, put the sun at our backs. Uh, unfortunately, in this current position, Vim and I are staring straight into the sun, uh, giving us funny sort of wrinkled looks on our faces. So I'm just going to turn around. We are not leaving him. Don't worry. I just want to. Get that sun out of our eyes. There we go, that's a bit better. There we 
you go. Tail end of a leopard. It is incredible. So, I mean, if we think about the last year, that Imvula was definitely the dominant male in this area. And now he's a dispersal male again. So male leopards, once they get a bit older and they get pushed out of their territories, they become nomadic. And uh, they will sneak around and jump between different male leopard territories, trying to avoid the dominant males. In some cases, uh, when they're a bit younger than sort of Mvula, if they lose a piece of their territory, they'll go try to fight a, a male leopard they don't think as, is as dominant as they are. But in this case, Mvula is a bit, a bit too old. His days of controlling vast swathes of African wilderness are drawing to, or oh, they, they are definitely closed. So he'll probably survive for another year or two. Uh, just sneaking around the peripheries, avoiding big male leopards. Hi, Sammy from the Lone Star State. Uh, Sammy is wondering, as leopards age, does their fur turn white like other animals? Uh, it does get a little bit paler and you can see some sort of graying in the, in, the, in the chops around the face, but I've never seen a leopard turn completely white. Our leopard is by far the most wide spread of the big cats, occurring right through Africa into the Middle East and uh, into Asia and India and all the way into Russia, China. So Kat is wondering, are leopards cleaner than lions? Uh, they seem to be grooming and they do look a little bit cleaner. I wouldn't necessarily say that they, they're cleaner than lions. Maybe they spend a bit more time grooming themselves, but lions have the benefit of friends and family to groom them. So that does make a difference. I'd say they're both pretty dirty animals, although they, neither of them look particularly dirty, but they are covered in little parasites and things, and quite smutty too. So if we go back into the evolution of a leopard, and, and, and modern day leopards are said to have evolved anywhere from 470 uh, to 825,000 years ago. The oldest leopard ancestor fossils are from 3.5 million years ago. And they migrated across between Africa and the Middle East at about 170,000 years ago. And at that time, um, the area was much drier, so the sea was much lower. Uh, so the ice, the polar ice caps were much bigger. So, and what is desert today was actually very, very lush green savanna, the Sahara, uh, Iran, uh, those deserts. And there was actually a land bridge between Africa and the Middle East at that stage. And it's the same land bridge that people used to migrate out of Africa uh, that a lot of different animals both migrated 
to Africa and from Africa. So very, very interesting. Leopards survived through the majority of Europe until about 24,000 years ago. And it's mostly competition with humans at that stage that would have seen them move out. So they would never have occurred in the densities that we get in Africa or India or Sri Lanka because um, the temperate forests of, of England are not really, or England, sorry, not England, of Europe, Old World Europe, um, France, uh, Spain, Portugal, Italy are, are, are really, really, they don't hide, hold high animal densities. So you would have found the leopards there, the territories would have been much bigger. And then also there's not that much game in a temperate forest compared to a savanna or to a mixed woodland like we're in now. So you would have found that competition with people would have been the main reason for them becoming extinct in Europe. Now, there's a lot of, just even with African leopards, a lot of different diversity in terms of coat coloration and uh, even rosette size, rosette density. And there are some very, very beautiful ones. Melanie in the Great White North of Canada and Toronto, to be more specific, has been watching for quite a while, but this is her first question. So congratulations, Melanie, and a great question it is. Um, I was talking about how Mvula has become a nomadic male leopard, and uh, she's wondering, will these nomadic males still mate with females? Now, I'm pretty sure they might try, but the problem is that a female in the estrus makes a lot of noise and attracts quite a lot of attention. So there is a possibility they might run in with one of the bigger males, but definitely I'm sure they would try. Continue their lineage on a little bit further. But so uh, thanks, Melanie. Keep asking questions. That was a really good one. Mr. Tingana has not moved a muscle. He did give us a little bit of false hope as he groomed a little bit, but he groomed for a good, good little snooze. Now there's a couple of different color variations in leopards that are more out there than others. And the most common form of that is the uh, menalistic form, which is often referred to as a black panther. And of course, panthers um, are not panthers at all, but they are black leopards and it's a recessive gene uh, that, that continues through. There's certain areas where it is more common, and uh, one of the areas is not too far, probably about 200 kilometers from here, up in the mountains, and near Leidenberg, and the other is in the Congo Basin rainforest, where actually being black would be quite beneficial. So 
hello again, Ivan from Serbia, who started watching yesterday. And we've just been chatting about color variations in big cats. And Ivan says at their zoo at home, there are white lions. Now he's asking, is this because of specific breeding in the zoo or can it occur in the wild? Um, most white lions are from, cho because they've chosen to breed uh, the animals holding that gene. But it does happen in the wi a wild, but very rarely. And actually just north of us, the Timbavati uh, Game Reserve is the area most famous for its white lions. They've got a couple at the moment. And also recently there were three or four born in the east, central, eastern part of Kruger National Park around Satara. So they do happen in the wild, but very, very rarely. Come, Mr. T. Time to get up. He looks very, very comfortable. Now, the first people to keep leopards, so to speak, uh, were the Romans, actually. So they were caught and they used to keep them um, for shows and, and as pets. Not a very good idea and it, it didn't work too well for them. Quite a few injuries. So Billy is wondering, are leopards poached at all and is it a problem? Billy is from Texas. Well, Billy, the thing about leopards is we, if you, no one really knows how many leopards are left in the wild. And there's various different figures that are bantered about. Um, they are poached for their skins. And uh, in South Africa, there is a religious organization uh, called the Shembe Church where somehow, it's very strange, somewhere along the line, it, it decided that everyone had to wear leopard skins. And the, the, me, the men in the church had to wear leopard skins. But, uh, and the skins don't, if you wear them quite regularly, they don't last too long, so they wear out and you've got to keep replacing them. And there was so many leopard skins, I mean, the church has over a million followers, that no one was quite sure where all these skins were coming, coming from. There's actually a very interesting documentary on it. It's called To Skin a Cat. And I uh, actually know some of the people who are involved in this project. And uh, they came up with a very solution with a synthetic uh, fabric, leopard uh, sort of shawl and stuff that they would w wear traditionally at the church. So that seems to be working much better. But we don't know how many leopards are, but they are definitely poached for their skins in certain areas. I'd say in the area we're in at the moment, they're not really poached and they are quite stable. One of the biggest threats to leopards in, in this part of the world uh, would be crossing main highways. And quite a few of them get hit by cars. And there's no fence that can keep a leopard in. If a leopard wants to get out, it'll get out. But uh, obviously all normal fences, of course, not specialized fences. And they are, and they do move vast distances. Uh, a collared dispersal male was in northern Zululand and he moved in the space of about six months uh, over 700 kilometers uh, into the Kruger National Park through farmland, through villages, through towns to get there. So they are incredibly adaptable and, and one of the most widespread of the big cats with the most diverse habitat. They really only really uh, avoid true, true, true dry desert. And they've been found high up in the mountains uh, one was even found frozen up in Kilimanjaro. But desert, rainforest, savanna, grassland, you leopards can survive in. Hello, Gracie. Gracie is one of our favorite regular viewers and she's eight years old. Gracie would like to know, is this a daddy leopard? 
Uh, yes, Gracie, it is. He's the big daddy at Jumo at the moment. And Gracie would like to know, will he play with his cubs? Sometimes male leopards do, sometimes they don't. I have never seen Mr. Tingana with cubs, so I can't say just yet, but hopefully he will. He'll definitely tolerate his cubs. But there we go. Of course, he does not quite sure, or well, he thinks they're his cubs. They might not be his cubs, you never know. Female leopards have lots of daddies. But speaking of female leopards, let's jump back on board with Jamie, who's still with the Queen. She is absolutely incredible. The speed that she covered the distance between where we, where we lost her at Treehouse Dam to here, Dave and I were one step behind her every second of the way. She just covered that ground so fast. She's hot now, though. She's a very hot, tired leopard. And as we mentioned, or as we've touched upon, it is a very warm day this afternoon. Those beautiful, perfect paws that left such lovely marks in the sand for me to follow. Shame. You can see how she's, how rapidly she's panting. She covered in a straight line, and I mean it really was almost a straight line, but she followed the roads almost all the way, and she covered what would I guess at that distance? Probably a kilometer. So just over half a mile. In less than 10 minutes? Probably less than that. Just walking. She wasn't running. Her tracks were not running. She was walking fast. Just gives you an idea of how much distance a leopard can really cover if they want to and why it should never come as a surprise that one afternoon you've got a leopard on one side of the reserve and the next day they've completely crossed in, an, in the opposite direction and covered a tremendous amount of ground. I'm exhausted just looking at her. Annabella, who is watching in Pittsburgh and is six years old. Annabella, you would like to know, is this cat all alone? And yes, she is all alone at the moment, apart from us. And she likes being alone. Leopards really, really like to be all on their own, except when they are mummies. And she is a new mummy. She's got two tiny little babies that she's hidden carefully away. And she's spent the whole day with them now and she's only just left them safe and asleep to come and have some dinner. So she spent the last close to 24 hours, a whole day with her cubs. So that's one of the only times, Annabella's, that, that leopards don't like to be on their own is when they've got babies. And the males, when they are ready to mate with the females, will also be with other leopards. But otherwise, a leopard is a secretive animal. It likes to stay invisible and hidden and move about all on their own. And it's totally, totally different from lions. Lions live within their families. Leopards, once they're old enough, when they're sort of two years old, sometimes two and a half, then it's time for them to move away from their moms and find their own special space. And they keep that special space just to themselves. Our mommy leopards, when their daughters are fully grown, will give their daughters a little bit of their own territory. So she'll basically give, make her daughters her neighbors. But even then, when they meet each other, they don't really appreciate each other's presence. I've seen Karula growling at Shadow before. And it's not because they're antisocial. It's just because that's how life works for them. That's the easiest way for them to go about it. Now, hopefully at some point, I can't obviously reposition and make her feel uncomfortable, but hopefully at some point she will shift around and you will get to see those suckle marks that I described from where she's been feeding her youngsters. This is such an incredible, yes, we didn't see it for the whole story, but this is such an incredible lesson in leopard movement. She's a new mom. 
her cubs are six, where are we in March? Her cubs are actually almost nearly two months old, but just under two months old. She made a kill. She walked a path straight back towards her cubs. She stayed with them for close to 24 hours, and then she walked back the exact same path over her own tracks and back to her kill. Just a really interesting observation about her. But she's found herself, now that she's here, she's actually too hot and too tired to go and eat right at the moment. She's just taking some time to recover herself. One moment. Because of my current position in a tamboti tree, that's better. There we go. Sorry, Karula. I was just shifting my antenna. We're going to touch on a, a relatively in intricate question that I'm going to cover in the barest of details just because we can't go into or it's going to be very difficult to go into the amount of detail that this question really res really deserves but Ravi has read recently about lions being poisoned by farmers after they got in and killed some of the farmers livestock and was wondering if the same thing ever happens with leopards if there's ever an issue between leopards and farmers I would argue that it's even more so with leopards and farmers and that's because leopards cannot be fenced. You cannot fence a leopard. They will find their way out and they will jump over or they will climb a tree and jump down over the other side. There's no way you can keep a leopard where it doesn't want to be kept in, in, in this sort of conservation industry. Our new leopard being the prime example. And yes, sometimes that means that they wander onto farmland and sometimes they do take farmers' livestock. And it's something that is recently the mindset within, this is the positive swing to things, the mindset within South Africa at least is very much in the process of changing completely from the farmer's side. So there is compensation awarded to the farmer whose livestock is killed by a wild animal. And they are also offered compensation if they do not shoot the leopard or poison the leopard, but rather to alert the authorities who will then come and remove the leopard if possible. Some farmers are even taught the value of having a leopard on their property and the way in which it can, or the, the least amount of impact that it actually has on the situation. And a lot of farmers out here really appreciate having the big cats moving about. You can understand it from their perspective. Of course, poisoning is not the answer, and of course, that's the last thing we want. It does occur, but it is changing. And hopefully that change will start to spread further north into Africa as well. The, the, the thing about leopards, of course, is that also they are very a wild leopard, a truly, truly unhabituated, completely wild leopard, is a very difficult thing to find and to see. Sorry, Dave. Uh. <laughs> what were they doing, Karula? Were those spur fowl making a terrible racket? It just flew over the top of her head. They were chasing each other through the sky. But they didn't even notice her in their preoccupation with each other. The question of interaction between wild animals and farmers and townships and villages alike is one that is very exceptionally complex and one that has so many different solution, possible solutions. And I promise you that in a lot of places throughout Africa, those solutions are being very practically approached and implemented. So I have quite, I mean, obviously my heart falls every time I read a story like the one that you described. 
but I am filled with plenty of hope for change in the future. The worst thing that the farmers can use is poison as well, because they'll poison a carcass and they won't necessarily get the, get the lions that they are after, or they will get the lions and they'll get the hyenas, and they'll get the vultures and the jackal that feed on the carcass afterwards. But we can all, in our little way, teach people a different approach. And M. Kiss, welcome to the Sunset Safari. M. Kiss was wondering a little bit about tagging animals. So M. Kiss knows that in certain areas they tag animals for locating and for research purposes and was wondering if that ever occurs here. And the answer is yes, it does. Certain research organizations do tag different animals. And I've seen a couple of elephants with radio frequency collars on their backs or around their necks that allows them to be and probably with gps capabilities as well so essentially that collar will send out the position of the elephant herd a couple of times a day and record them so that their movements can be monitored i've also seen buffalo with radio collars around their necks it's not done with every animal for example it's not something that has been done to karula or to any of the leopards that we see in this area. And the reason is we get, because we have so many vehicles driving around, and there are so many guides operating in this area, we get plenty of information that we do record and report, and all of the lodges do. Every single one of our leopard sighting or our lion sightings or wild dog sightings is recorded by Panthera, which is a very large research organization. So it's not necessary for us to tag some a leopard like Karula. It's, it's always a toss up in that situation between the impact that you're going to have on the animal versus what you are going to get out of it. So researching the movements of elephants is so crucial in order to really study the way in which they respond to different environmental situations and different pressure situations. And they can use that information to then help with the conservation species as a whole, conservation of the species as a whole throughout South Africa. So I've worked, in I worked intensely before I started at Wild Earth with telemetry kits and using radio frequency collars to locate certain animals. But for a leopard like Karula, it doesn't need to happen. It is, it is, there's no denying the fact that it will be a traumatic experience for that animal. They have to be darted, the collar has to be fitted, if indeed it is a collar. They've also tested radio tracking devices within the abdomen of the animal, but that is also requires quite an intensive and invasive surgery. So the other option is the collar, but then you've got to change the batteries on the collar every so often, which means relocating and darting that animal once again and relocating it to, or changing the batteries and then waking it up. So it's just a toss up between the damage versus the rewards that come from it. is watching Karula very carefully as her tail flicks up and moves about every now and again. And she was wondering if perhaps it is an indication or whether or not it's true, the story that leopards lift their tails up like that whenever they get spotted as basically a way of saying to the animals in the area, okay, I know you've seen me. Please don't alarm call anymore. I get it, I'm moving out. I'm not gonna hunt any of you. And in this situation, her I, and I must say, I've noticed, particularly with Karula, she seems to have a, a very mobile tail. Uh, I don't think there is very much in the way of conscious control that a leopard has had has over its tail. I spoke about it yesterday, the fact that I've seen leopards give themselves away by flicking their tails while they're hunting. And I often wonder, 
why it is that that happens, what it is that's led to that lack of control over a tail that it can mess up a hunt for them. They do, when they are spotted, they do lift their tails. You saw the way that Karula walked down along the dam wall with that squirrel alarm calling at her. She had her tail curled right up over her back. So when they are spotted, yes, they do lift their tails. Whether it's because they are acknowledging that they've been, they have been seen or whether they know that they've been seen and therefore they can't hunt and it doesn't matter if they make themselves obvious, I couldn't give you an exact answer. At the moment, she's just subconsciously flicking her tail, probably in response to flies that are moving about her head. You can see her ears going furiously as well. It's very much a... A flicking tail in a cat, of course, can very much be a sign of aggression as well. Aggression or irritation. And I've seen that in Karula a few times, where she has made a mistake during a hunt and she starts to thrash her tail, clearly irritated with herself. And I've seen her flick her tail angrily at alarm-calling monkeys. Oh, she's exhausted. Karula, you've come all this way, but now are you too tired to eat? Now, Sue, just before Karula lay her head down, you'd actually noticed something that I was looking at as well, and that was the flap of skin underneath Karula's neck. And you were asking that you thought only males had dewlaps, or do females as well, or is it just Karula showing her age? And to be honest, I think it's Karula showing her age. Females do have a flap of skin underneath their chins. It's not nearly as pronounced as it is in the large males. Oh, flies are driving her mad. But I think in this case, Karula's is more prominent because she's getting slightly older. I've noticed that her abdomen also sags quite a lot. That's, I think, because she's carried so many litters of cubs that she's actually possibly even slightly split the wall of the stomach muscle, which does occur in a lot of mammals when they've been pregnant regularly. So she's got a slightly, I don't want to call her it's a flabby belly, She's got a floppy belly and quite a floppy neck as well, and that's because she's getting older, her skin is losing elasticity, it's losing subcutaneous fat, as occurs with all mammals, including us as human beings. It's particularly pronounced with her. Now, Ephraim wants to come and join us in the sighting, so I just want to chat with him on the Game Drive channel, since our space is very limited. While I have that chat, let's go back over and find out what Brent's leopard is doing. So, Mr. Tingana has moved a little bit, but his nose is still definitely uh, to the ground and, and, and very much a snooze, snoozing quite comfortably there. And he's just rolled over a few times, so not much movement. Uh, it is still quite warm, and we're hoping as that sun dips below the horizon, he might think about going for a stroll, maybe for a hunt. Who knows, maybe he'll find where Karula is and steal her kill. So definitely going to be an exciting second part of this sunrise safari. I'm sure Karula might start feeding as well. So lots to look forward to here on Safari Live. So, Survey is wondering which of the big cats have the best eyesight. Well, I would say they probably all got very, very good eyesight. And it would be difficult to say which one's got the best. Um, their eyes are all very similar designed. So, I would say all of them have equally good eyesight.
So, Connor, who's in Massachusetts, uh, would like to know if there are any incidences of leopards hunting in groups. Uh, not to my knowledge, Connor, occasionally when the, there is a mating pair around, they might both stalk the same animal, but it's by no means cooperative hunting. And uh, I've never seen that, and I've never really heard of cooperative hunting in leopards. That is the do domain of the lion, which is the only truly social cat we have here, or actually in the world. Look how his tail's resting on that branch. It almost looks like he's holding it up there. It's not. It's on a, a little branch which is keeping it up. It does make him look slightly less asleep, but uh, he is very much snoozing heavily at the moment. He's not moving, but Karuda looks like she's moving towards where she's got some meat in a tree. <laughs> Karuda got up with great purpose and started moving towards the kill. And I said that she was, I said to Dave that she's definitely going to go and start eating. She's definitely not, clearly. All she did was reposition a little bit on the drainage line wall. Hello, girl. She's giving herself a very thorough cleaning, getting rid of all of the ticks that have been clinging to her fur. Now, Red, who is one of our newer viewers on watching on YouTube, Reid would like to know, as the leopards get older, will they finish their kill or do they get too tired and just abandon it? Very much depends on the situation and not so much to do with the leopard's age as to what's happening in its life right at that moment. So most of the time, no, a leopard will not waste a good kill. They will make sure that they return to it as often as possible until they have finished off all that they want, all that they can, at which point they will move on. Sometimes, however, in the space that they might move, say, between their kill and some water to have a drink, they might find that a steenbok crosses their path, and they, or a little antelope crosses their path, and they grab that and decide to feed on that instead. For example, the last kill that Karula abandoned was the dake that we know of. There was the Dacre up in the Jackalberry close by Buffles Hook Dam, mm, catching flies. And that was due to the fact that she heard Tingana and Tundi mating. <laughs> Getting ready to spring into action there. Good scratch at the back of the neck. But yes, it was because she heard the, her daughter mating with Tingana in the center of her territory. And funnily enough, she wasn't terribly impressed with that, especially since she was heavily pregnant at the time and a couple of days away from giving birth. So it depends more on the circumstances than the leopard's age. making sure that we reposition in time to get her climbing up the tree to retrieve the kill. of the Tamburti tree, where her kill is hidden. Let's 
see how she decides to approach this. I think it's best for us to just stay here. I can almost feel her mustering up that spring. Before she leaps, here she goes. Oh, no, she stopped for a scratch again. Giving me a chance to reposition. Sorry, Dave, you're going to have to be backwards. You good? see her thinking about it. She's just a little bit hot and a little bit tired. Looking at it, it's tempting. Come on, girl. Up you go. <laughs> the suspense. I can see, I can see her counting in her head. I'm gonna jump on three. One, two, okay, no, maybe not. Actually, I'm still a little bit hot and still a little bit tired. And maybe I've just changed my mind. I think I'm gonna go to the most difficult spot on the top of the drainage line and lie down there. Maybe something's worth sniffing here. Anything to distract her. <laughs> the jump that she needs to make. What is she investigating up there? Now, if she goes further into that block, it could be the last view that we have of her for now. Just because there's no way we will be able to get up there to join her. And by the time we get around, she'll probably have come back down into the drainage line again. Oh, back again. Okay. This could be it. She just took herself aside to have a stern talking to. Don't worry, Karula. It looks like a daunting jump to me, too. Another big yawn. And there she goes. I think she's going to take it down. It was the most amazing demonstration of power and grace from Karula's side. Oh! And there she goes. Isn't it interesting how she went and investigated that spot first? I don't know for what reason. And only then did she go and fetch the kill and take it right back there. Just a fascinating way that she went about things. Um, there is another vehicle in this sighting, and from where they are sitting, they absolutely cannot really see her. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to shift further forward so that Ephraim can pull up behind me try and keep her in view. It might be a bit awkward for Dave, but we'll make a plan. While we do that, let's go back over to Brent and Tingana. So he's rolled over again. And that's about the sum total of the updates from Viam and myself. But we are getting quite positive that as it gets cooler, 
he's hopefully going to get moving. The sun is setting below the western horizon, and I'm hoping as the temperature drops, it'll give him a little bit of motivation to go find a meal. Very, very beautiful. The sun is not quite dipping below, but it will in the next couple of minutes. And uh, I think what we'll do is we're not going to go too far, but I don't think he's going to move in the next two minutes. So let's go have a quick look at that gorgeous sunset. Oopsie. Oh, we caught a guari bush. Hello, big boy. Sorry about that. Oh, oh. oh. Jack caught a quarry bush as we went past and just made a little bit of noise. Oh, big yawn. Look at those teeth. Oh, I was too slow with my camera. Okay, well, he has started that little bit of grooming, which is always a good sign that maybe our little accidental rattle of the bush might have a sp spiked him into movement. Now, a very good sign. And when leopards do start grooming, although he played with us a little bit earlier, he started grooming and went to sleep, but it was still quite hot. Another yawn on the way. Sniffing the wind. Watch you smelt. Probably just doing a quick test. No, he's definitely smelt something. I think it's coming from behind us. Maybe it wasn't us that's suddenly caught his interest. I wonder if it's another male leopard. Well, not too perturbed, back to licking. We're not that far from where we had that unrelaxed male uh, yesterday and this morning. And he, I'm pretty sure he has been around chasing him this morning. behind his ear there. Two big ticks. Oh, tail cleaning time. Got a perfect little rest to put his tail on while he gives it a good lick and a bit of a de-flea, de-tick. So Lee Pad would like to know if leopards have individual preferences when it comes to foods. Um, for example, is Tingana a warthog specialist? Um, he, has, he actually is quite a, a warthog specialist, but he's also an artfark specialist. We have seen him eating artfark before, and he killed, I think, last year about four or five artfark, something we barely see. Um, and we got to see them hanging in a tree with this guy. Yeah, uh, sniffing, the sniffing the wind again. Okay. Yeah, from this dollar, where did you see them exactly? To my daughter. Yeah, fam. I'm bringing the same down again. Then I'm going to eat a lot of the ticket. So he's 
definitely interested in something. Just testing the wind. It does look like he might get moving. And we're hoping he moves west towards the setting sun and not east towards the rising sun. And we are very close to our eastern edge of our traverse area. Oh, scratch, 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 scratch. Well, Heidi in Ontario said she's just noticed something. Do female leopards have a white tip and males a black tip? No, he's also got a white tip to his tail, Heidi. It's just uh, he's keeping it facing down. So the top of the female's leopard, uh, the top of a female leopard's tail is also, there we go, you can see it's white. It's always white underneath, but not on top. Oh, you can see how flexible a leopard is. There we go, is he? stretches out to do a bit more grooming. And you can see those muscles rippling under that back leg. It's almost flexing for us. He does have a bit of a bodybuilder frame, old Mr. Tingana. Taking a tick off. Now, oh, is it time? No, not yet. Chasing other males up and down. So now that's a territorial call. It's either called swing or rasping. Yes, yeah, so you, you told them, Tingana, you told them. So he's letting all the other leopards in the area know that he is the dominant male here. Yeah? I think with these other males being around over the last few days, we might get quite a lot of vocalization from him tonight. Yeah. <laughs> oh, excuse me. Standing by, Ephraim. Ephraim, did you get the audio? Yeah. Copy, keep coming. I You'll see my mobile. We're right next to the road on Central, just past, uh, just to the east of uh, Junction with Drakensberg. I might call again. He's listening to see if there's any replies to his challenge. flies. Oh, back to preening.
No, don't go that way. Let's move back slightly. Eating a bit of grass to aid with uh, digestion. Where will he go? That is the question. Will he head deeper into Juma, or will he depart us again? It always does look strange when you see a big cat eating grass. <laughs> that sort of... Oh, oh. Definitely not designed for that. While we wait for him to get moving, let's jump back with Jamie and Karula. How lucky are we? One leopard crawling right next to the vehicle, the other consuming her meal from the safety of the long grass on the top of the drainage line wall. Uh, Dave and myself have just been sitting, enjoying the peace and tranquility that this drainage line provides. It's wonderfully quiet down here and yet at the same time there's all kinds of bird life that's come fluttering through and of course all accompanied to the sound of a very ravenous mom Ooh. which way are we going to go girl okay mm. perfect Great shot. <laughs> I was going to say accompanied by the ravenous sound of the mom devouring her nyala kill. Let's see if we... Um, I think that's going to be as good as we get. Oh, girl, how's that nyala going down? Because it is a young nyala, the bones are still incredibly soft when compared to that of an adult. And you'll find that with all baby antelope, leopards are quite capable of eating the entire carcass from nose to tail, including sometimes the hooves. Sometimes they need to cough those back up and bring them back up which is one thing that Tingana might be trying to do with his current appetizing dinner of grass blades. I've seen Karula devour an entire steenbok, leaving nothing behind but a piece of the lower jaw. And she's been caring for two young leopard cubs that have teeth coming through and learning to use their claws and will be alert enough now to be playing. So I'm sure that she's feeling absolutely exhausted and is really enjoying a meal all to herself. <laughs> the peace and tranquil, a relative peace and tranquility away from the youngsters. She's certainly not holding back when it comes to this meal. I'm trying to decide if moving slightly further forward will improve our view or completely ruin it. I think we'll stick with the view that we that we have for now. Oh, 
little bit of a hairball there. Mm. Slow down a bit, Karula. Give yourself some time to swallow the first mouthful before absorbing or before inhaling the second. Oh, Miss Lynn, you were wondering on the subject of Cat's body language, we spoke about her tail going furiously. You were wondering if, like domestic cats, a cat will ever arch its back and raise its hackles, or a leopard will ever do that like a cat does. And the answer is not really. It's not something you usually see. They will puff themselves up, or a lot of mammals do that when they are feeling frightened or trying to appear aggressive. Just like that mating display of Nyala. So yes, their fur will go up, but their hackles are not particularly prominent. And instead of arching their back, a leopard that is angry, feeling aggressive, will drop low to the ground and start to thrash its tail. I've never seen a, a leopard arch its back, and I've never seen any pictures of a leopard arching its back in that way. So although a lot of the cues are that leopards give off in their body language are easily comparable to domestic cats, that is something completely different. That being said, African wild cats do it. I have seen Caracal do it before, so the medium-sized cats. I assume that Serval will do it as well. It's not something I've ever seen, but I assume that they would. But once you get to the larger cats of the cat family, you'll find that they no longer demonstrate that behavior. Of course, that's the way, the arching of the back is a way of making the cat look bigger and scary. Perhaps it's just because leopards and lions, when they are feeling a bit angry, are quite capable of showing that without making themselves look even bigger. I'm not sure. Or it's just a completely differently evolved evolutionary pattern of behavior. You can see that tail still going. I'm sure, I'm not sure if any of our regular viewers agree with me about Karula's tail and the fact that it moves as frequently as it does. Maybe I'm imagining it. I do feel like she's got a very, an almost overactive tail, though. It's really interesting. Oh, did you see that piece of fur that went flying there? Out of her mouth. And she will even eat the skin and the fur. She'll try and pluck some of it away but she will still ingest a great deal of it. And as a result, she will cough up a fur ball at some point just to get rid of that excess. And it'll contain bits of bone that her stomach, a little bit too big for her stomach to cope with, maybe a hoof or two, and a lot of that fur, which is completely indigestible to her and of no nutritional value. She has plucked as she's gone along, though. This is actually a lovely view through the bright green leaves. year-old viewer in Ohio, Sarah was wondering about whether or not leopards are ever branded. And that's because she's been doing some research into the skybed males. And she's read into the fact that some of them were branded as a result of a rabies outbreak. She was wondering if it's anything similar has happened with leopards. Not, Sarah, not that I'm 100% sure, to be completely honest. I don't think so. But it might have been something that's happened in the past that's now been stopped for the future. And of course, we know our individual leopards so well that we don't need brands to be able to identify them. And the research organizations have got such a good handle on the different identities that they don't need to in any way mark the leopards. Now, I just want to raise a point here. She is on the ground. Now, last night we spoke a lot about the fact that a kill up in the tree 
it's okay to put the spotlight on the leopard because their kill is out of harm's way. A, lep a hyena couldn't come and steal it from them. And he made that comparison between Tingana, who left his impala kill on the ground, and now and Karula with her kill up in the air, as well as that the leopard that Brent has been working on habituating. She's now back on the ground. And because of that, I'm not going to stay past the point that it gets dark. That's because I don't want to bring any hyenas in the area across to her. It's a, it's a judgment call at this point because she might have finished the kill before, she, before it does actually get dark, at which point we will be able to follow her. But um, we've got as much time as we have light for the camera, essentially. As long as you can still see her, I will stay with her without any artificial light once it gets too dark, just like we do with the hyena den. Once it gets too dark, then we shall move off. I'll also let the other vehicles in the area know that her kill is back on the ground and that the sighting is therefore closed until she leaves this area. But I really, it's a difficult one because I really think she's going to have finished this in the next few minutes. Look at the way she was using her molars there to shear away the pieces of skin and muscle and bone. He's got to a particularly crunchy bit. was but survey you were wondering a bit about the layout of a leopard's teeth and it's such a pity survey I don't have the picture in my book of the leopard skull I know that Brent actually has I'm, I'm fairly certain that Brent has one with him so perhaps we can pass that question on to him as well but I will give you to the sort of the best of my understanding the layout of a leopard's teeth unlike us They've actually got six incisors in the front of their mouths, and like our four, so six at the top, six at the bottom. Then obviously the four canine teeth, and then three molars on the top, three molars on each side, and then three molars at the bottom. And the back molars in particular are particularly well developed and deeply rooted close to the jaw. And the, the lower and the upper jaw in order to create that shearing like surface that allows them to crunch through bone and muscle like this uh, quite a different structure to our own teeth our teeth have the ridges on our molars are relatively flat so we've got grinding surfaces and less of that cutting surface even though we do have ridges on our teeth themselves they're not nearly as pronounced as they are in a leopard. And I'm just triple checking my book. I don't think I have the right book to show you this. I'm just double checking. No, unfortunately, uh, I don't have the book with the picture of the leopard skull in it. Fingers crossed, Brent does have that with him and he'll be able to add to my description of the shape of the teeth. Uh, I've had various opportunities to examine leopard and lion skulls and their teeth are the most phenomenal con phenomenally constructed instruments I've held a lion's molar before and the bit that you see sticking out sorry not molar canine I've held a lion's canine and examined it and the bit that you see sticking out is less than half of the entire tooth the rest of that is made up in the root system that holds those canines in place. 
And that makes total sense because long canines, the longer a canine is, the weaker it's going to be. It's like it's easier to snap a long stick rather than a short stick, essentially. So they need to be very, very securely fastened into a leopard's jaw. Now we're going to stick with Karula for as long as possible without putting any lights on her, just in case she does decide to get up and move. But Tingana's up, let's go to Brent. So the moment we've all been waiting for for many hours on today's sunset safari. Tingana on the move. Now, as he got moving, he actually soared again. So oh, oh, that wonderful sound. There we go. He's going to scent mark for you. And VM and I will be treated to the smell of buttered popcorn as we go past. And that's what a leopard scent mark smells like. Ah, oh. watch the popcorn. Look at that, he's heading in the right direction, further into Juma. Some more scent marking. So leopards, unlike lions, will often call when they're on the move. So call while they are walking. The lions will generally stop and be stationary when they call. Where are you off to, mister? Sky, leopard, where else would you rather be but on safari with us? So, Lance, who's watching on YouTube, and I did mention Tingana looks a little bit peckish, was wondering whether he might steal a Karula's kill. Now, there, if he does catch a whiff of it, um, he might definitely steal her kill. Male leopards are renowned for stealing females' kills. Now it's time to test my reversing skills. Another little scent mark. I've almost got my finger on the ignition to turn it off in case he starts calling and we'll be able to get the full blast directly at us. You can see he pays us no heed as he marches off, oh, yawning, on his territorial patrol. AJ is wondering, will Tingana and Karula meet? There is a possibility, AJ. Um, 
And if it does happen, she, he might steal her kill. Oh, he's listening. There's hyenas calling in the distance. But they have met many times before, and they've mated many times before. So there's even a possible, there's a strong possibility that Karuna's current litter of cubs was fathered by him. says we're out there for a long time and he's wondering where we take any snacks with us out on drive. Uh, yes, we do. Um, I don't too much. The cameramen are great snackers. VM in particular ate two bananas today. So I'm just going to let him walk past us. You'll see how close he comes to the vehicle, and then we're going to follow behind for a bit, because I want to see if we can get that spectacular sky behind him for a little while. So I'm just going to move off the road slightly and let him walk past us. Here he comes. Hello, big man. how close he is to the vehicle. Right next to us, isn't that incredible? Okay, can you just turn around quickly? Has he stopped? Oh, he said walking, sorry. There he goes. Ah, there is the most spectacular sky just behind him. This road is going to turn off into that colour shortly. Mm, the smell of buttered, buttered popcorn everywhere. Yeah, you can see that sky behind him, isn't it? Spectacular. So he's heading towards Juma Camp at the moment. He could veer off in any direction. But that's where he's heading at the moment, stopping for another scent mark. Vera in Ohio has got a question for both Jamie and myself. She says, now that we have settled and have decided to live in South Africa, um, do we know how to speak the language? Uh, well, Vera, interestingly enough, we are both South African. So um, we were born in South Africa. We're from South Africa. Um, I'm, so we can speak the language. Uh, the official language of the country is English. We do have 11 official languages, which is quite incredible. And I can speak a bit of some of them. 
So, Vera, let's see if you can speak any Osa. So, Vera, I want you to practice uh, saying a uh, very, very lovely little phrase. So, now, that means I can only speak a little bit of Osa. And it's one of the hardest things to say in the language. I can speak uh, a bit, a bit of Shanghai, and a bit of Zulu, uh, a bit of Swahili. He heard something, smelling something. So Barbara says she gets a little bit scared when the leopards walk past the car. But Shannon says it's awesome. I agree with you, Shannon. VM, were you scared? Mm -mm. Mm -mm. VM also loves it. And I think he's smelling something there. We can't really see he's gone to the thicket. Well, please don't go in there. That is a very thick area. He's maybe heard something, smelt something in this thicket here. Could be a scrub hair. Could be a spot where civets decided to spend the, the daytime. But he's definitely picked up on something. He's just sniffing at the moment. Try using the floodlight instead. Yep. He's going into the thicket. Stem book, a monitor lizard, a hare, a porcupine. No, he's decided not that interesting. He's not going to risk putting his face into the thorns. Okay, he's going to come so close to me now. He's probably now less than a foot from me. There's some thorns there. Let's keep very still, Vian. Doesn't want to push through the thorns. There you go. Hop, skip, and a jump. So, unfortunately, when they do get that close, you don't want to move the car when he's that close. It might give him a fright. So, we just keep very still. And he's still very interested in this thicket, but he's just gone to a different spot in it now. You got him, Vian? But it is a very particularly thorny thicket. And he doesn't seem too keen to actually go into it. Obviously he heard something small in there and decided it's worth investigating. We're not a very serious investigation just yet. Still scratching and looks like he's going to pop out in the road again in front of us. And on with the patrol.
Uh, Mary Beth in St. Catharines, Ontario, is wondering, do any of our big cats have a stinky urine spray like their tomcats? Well, no, not nearly as stinky as a house cat. Uh, leopard of a particularly pleasant one, as I said, it smells like buttered popcorn. Lions is quite odorless. I mean, you do get the slight smell of uric acid and that, things like that, but nothing highly offensive at all. And he's smelling the air again. Just checking, off he continues. So we're heading towards the little river system that comes out of the Buffalo's Hook Dam. And there's always a good chance there could be some Inyala and Bushbuck around there. But it's still a little bit further on. Now, if he does start stalking prey at night, I'll have to switch off the lights and sit in the dark, because we don't want to affect it in his favor or uh, in the Inyala or Impala's favor or whatever he might stalk. So, Michaela in Johannesburg is wondering whether leopards have a carnassal shear when they eat. And they do. Quite a lot of the big cats do. And it enables them to turn their head to the side and use it as sort of a, a cutting, like a big pair of scissors to open up carcasses. And, oh, that's going to be a, definitely a good scent marking spot. Oh, let's have a little sniff, a little rub and a little spray. Yep. There we go. Oh, big spray. He likes that spot. You can still see that color just fading above. Now, Karula is just down here, not too far away. The, her kill is just over there. So we're approaching that little river system now. Is he going to find any potential prey species up ahead? Well, first we're going to have a scratch. mark. So the reason that quite a lot of animals, lion, leopard, kick up the dirt like that is that that fresh soil that's just been tilled over uh, will hold their scent for a little bit longer. And 
his eyes in this magnificent following a male leopard as the darkness settles. And uh, it is going to be a stunning evening. Hopefully, for his sake, he'll catch something to eat. So, guys, it seems like you're having fun, and apparently there are lots of magnificent screenshots, so well done. Keep posting them, keep sharing them. Just remember the hashtag, Safari Live. Heading up towards that little riverbed now. He might take a shortcut, but we can't. He, I think he's going to go straight through here. We're going to loop around him. Hopefully, he doesn't deviate into the drainage system where we can't follow him. Let's quickly shoot around. Guys, very quickly, look at that. That is not something we see every day. And not this relaxed. But there is a little genet. I can't see the end of the tail to tell you whether it's a large spotted or small spotted. Oh, I'm going to turn the light off now because Tingana's going to about to appear. So I don't want to be interfering, but I'm sure that genet probably heard him. And wasn't that cool? We don't have to get to see that. And look how beautiful that shot was. A uh, black tip to the tail. Uh, who can tell me which genet it is? One's got a white tip, one's got a black tip. So a test for you guys on your nocturnal mammals. So which genet has a black tip to the tail? If you know the answer, send me the answer uh, on an email. There we go. <laughs> Perfect timing. On questions at wildearth.tv or use the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. Which of the genet species has a black tip to the tail. Well, thankfully, he didn't veer off down the drainage or river system. He's keeping on the road. He really does like this route. We've seen him use it multiple times in both directions. There you go, scent mark again. So we have a first time viewer called Stick Him Up. Welcome. He says, doesn't the animals, following the animals around like this bother them? Well, you can see this animal is not bothered at all. He literally is ignoring us completely. And uh, they do not have an instinctive response to vehicles and they don't smell like food. They smell like petrol and oil. And of course, if you drive badly and you drive too close to him and you harass them, you're definitely gonna have an interfering but if you stay back respectfully like we are, you can see absolutely no problem. Ooh, very interesting. He's turning down in Yala Road South. Now, he might, after all, bump into Karula and her kill. Just gotta be on the game drive radio for a second. Stations to go to now mobile south on Nyala Road South. So 
it's going to be fascinating to see if he picks up the scent of Karula and if not her kill. Now, survey on YouTube said, was that a server line genet? Unfortunately, we don't get server line genet here. Um, I have seen them in the rainforests of Gabon, but uh, we only get two species of genet here. One is a large spotted, one is a small spotted, and one of them has a black tip to the tail. So which one is it uh, that we saw today? Um, beautiful sighting, but definitely the best genet sighting I've had since I have been here. Okay, looks like he might go off road here. Well done, Raisa, Mike, Elaine, McKenna, and many, many others. You are spot on correct. That was indeed a large spotted genet. So the small spotted genet has a white tip to the tail. I'm just gonna move this light quickly there. There we go. So he is moving off the road now, which can make it a little bit difficult to follow him. Particularly if he heads into some thick stuff. We're okay for now. And we will be watching his behavior to see if he spots any potential prey species. Which he has. And I spotted them at the exact same time. And you can see him there. I'm about to turn off the light as well. You can see he's... I will take a flash, but now if we have a look with me then, no, 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 we're gonna go look, look in front. So there's the leopard. And if we do this, just very quickly, there's a Mignala just ahead of us. So now, unfortunately, it's lights off. And as I said, we don't want to interfere. So if we kept the light too long on the Mignala, it would blind them temporarily, making them a really easy target for the leopard. If we kept the light on the leopard, it would make it much easier for the Nyala to see them. So I will use the spotlight, but generally as a quick, look at that, flash every now and then just to check what's going on. And I won't point at the bright bit like this down here. I'll just use the right little peripheries that the light throws just to check what's going on. But very exciting. So there's probably about 40 meters between them at the moment. And uh, a leopard generally prefers to make that last dash from about, at best, the best possible is about five meters, but they will sometimes go from a bit further, sort of 10, eight to 10 meters. Now, in full charge, a leopard does 28, I'm oh, sorry, 24 meters per second. Okay, so I'm just checking what's going on. So you guys just gotta oh, find my game drive radio. That is the wrong one. Okay, so there's a new island of moving to this thick area over here. And that's good. He'll he'll like that. He won't like this very big open patch that's in front. He'd prefer that bit of bit of cover. So as an ambush predator, it, it, it does help to have as much cover as possible. And a bit of this greenery at the moment has definitely, definitely helped him. Now, strangely enough, this is about 100 meters from where we found him with that Impala on Saturday. Okay, so we're saying, yeah, we can call this Megala, then move out and just, uh, 
Oh, he's given up. So you read body language and that tells you whether he's hunting or not. And he's given up. I think those animals might have moved a bit too far and you can just see he's just walking away normally. He might change his mind and try stalking them again, but those Inyala were on the move when we spotted them. He's going to come out of the next road in not too long. And hopefully Vim and I don't get lost in the bush. I don't think we will, though. Isn't this spectacular? Following an adult male leopard in his prime through the darkness. I was really hoping he was going to choose the right hand road. But no such luck. So you'll notice that my light isn't on all the time. It is because I'm being attacked by a myriad of little black stink bugs, uh, as well as dung beetles and whatever bug, other bugs are around. Oh, just lost vision of them for a second. We couldn't get our car through there. I've right, got him again. No problems. So I'm hoping he does come out onto the next road shortly. Stopping, listening, and off he goes again. We will try to stay with them as long as possible, but sometimes following them off-road and at night can be quite tricky. Uh, he isn't as limited to the areas that he can pass through as we are. Yeah. Yeah, right, yeah. You OK, Vim? Yeah. I should pop, uh, sneak through this little arch. We OK? You OK, Vim? Uh, okay, wait, stop, stop. Stop, stop. You light? I'll go back. Go back. Stop. Ah, a little tree caught on one of them. Bungee cords. Don't worry, we haven't lost him. And he's, we're still on his trail. I think he should be coming up to Vulture's Nest Road shortly, which will make life a little bit easier. It's a shame. Is the cameraman OK? Uh, survey. So I just thought I saw something there. Um, why don't you ask him? Vim, are you OK? All right. There we go. There we go. There's the answer. Vim is right as rain. Later. Sorry? I'll check for blood later. He'll check for blood later. We're far too busy following a leopard for now. 
but I'm afraid this is not looking promising for us. Especially at night. Maybe we can find a gap. Oh, look at this. He's come back to the exact spot where the lion stole his impala. There you go. There he is. So, so on Saturday, no, dude, you didn't put it in the tree. That's why it's gone. There's no point looking in the tree. So he killed an impala, which I was lucky enough to see on foot. And now he's come back to check. But uh, the four male lions, known as the Birmingham Boys, or there's five of them in total, stole his impala here. Because he didn't put it in a tree, he left it on the ground. He's probably just having a sniff. That's exactly where he was feeding on it.